2002, an endowed fund was set up in her memory to support an annual lecture on sustainable design. Thanks in part to Sally's pioneering efforts, NYSIT is dedicated to educating future designers who incorporate sustainable solutions in their practices. Sustainability runs throughout our curriculum in nearly every program, and we have a one-year Master of Professional Studies degree in sustainable interior environments. Tonight, we are excited to have James Russell here with us. About six, five, six months ago, mm -hmm. uh, he was appointed the Director of Design Strategic Initiatives at the New York City Department of Design and Construction, the DDC, as it's known. It's responsible for renovating and building many of the civic facilities that we New Yorkers use every day to serve the public, public from libraries and courthouses to police precincts, senior centers, and more. They also work on the city's complex infrastructure, designing and improving roadways, sewer and water mains, sidewalks, and even pedestrian ramps. Uh, the scope of their work and their charge is really amazing. Now, James, his work focuses particularly on environmental sustainability, resiliency, equity, and healthy living, initiatives that are of utmost importance to our everyday lives, the built environment, and the very future of New York City. Before working at the DDC, James was, uh, and still is, an architecture critic, journalist, and consultant. For nine years, he was the architecture critic at Bloomberg News and covered the topic for Bloomberg Radio and Bloomberg TV. Prior to that, for 18 years, he was an editor at the magazine Architectural Record, the premier American journal for practicing architects helping to earn a National Magazine Award for General Excellence in 2003, as well as numer numerous other industry awards. He was also an adjunct professor at the Spitzer School of Architecture at the City College of New York. His book, The Agile City, Building, well Be Building Well-Being and Wealth in an Era of Climate Change, documents the low-tech and low-cost strategies for buildings and communities that promised dramatic reductions now in America's global warming efforts. James earned a Master's of Architecture degree from Columbia University and a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Design degree from the University of Washington. He is a registered architect and was elected a fellow of the American Institute of Architects in 2010. With all of that being said, please sit back, enjoy, and James, the podium is all yours. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I am an architect, but I actually have um, enormous respect for interior design and what you can do. Uh, and as they say, some of my best friends are interior designers. Um, and I, but I'm still recovering uh, from my day, which even though I'm supposed to be at DDC, I'm actually serving on a criminal trial. And I was like, it's 5.05, it's 5.10, they're doing closing arguments, the lawyer is winding up getting wound up, I should say, and I was like, just finish, finish, you know. So actually, I will go on Friday and deliberate on this um, strange criminal case. Uh, but uh, anyway, so I, I'm very happy to talk about, now do, do I just push the button here on the screen? Or? Oh, there it is, okay. I have to figure out which one's the forward, not that one. And I pointed at this thing, there we go, oops. Went too far. Did I go too far? I just have to, yeah, uh, just have to learn what I'm doing here. Okay. Uh, so as, as uh, your president said, I just joined the Department of Design and Construction. This just says a little bit about what we do. Uh, and as you can see, it's a $6 billion portfolio. So it's really a lot of things. So you've certainly set foot in buildings that DDC has been do, has done or has had a role in. We're almost like a, a design firm ourselves in that we are kind of a client to over 20 city agencies. And so they bring us the projects. We don't get to start the projects ourselves no matter how much they think they should be done. For example, this courthouse that I've spent all together too much time and really needs a lot of work. Uh, and so this just gives you a little bit of flavor of what we do. On the upper left is, the, uh, is a salt shed down uh, along the West Side Highway, down at Tribeca. 
So we, we felt that the, with the Department of Sanitation that that really needed to be you know, an important piece of design, not just a box or a tent that you often see. On the upper right is part of our resiliency work with the Parks Department. Uh, this is on the Rockaways. That's a breakaway stairway that reduces the impact of waves in the event of a storm. The canopy is actually just makes it a much nicer comfort station than it ever was before. But there are also elements not shown in the picture that slow down storms, storm surges and floods. So that's some of the work that we're doing. Below left is one of our library buildings. We do a lot of work for the three library systems of New York. Uh, and uh, you know some of it, you know, we're very proud of. On the right is the Sculpture Center in Queens, very in Long Island City, very close to where our offices are. So it gives you a little flavor of the various uh, work that we do. Now, guiding principles, that's a kind of mysterious uh, topic. And in fact, about um, a minute after I joined DDC, they said, you're doing guiding principles. And I said, oh, what are they? Uh, but we're an agency of 1,300 people, we have to, there's always much more to do than we can possibly accomplish because of money needs and uh, you know what our agencies need is so much more than what we're able to build for them. So there's often a lot of angst about you know how much how much can we do? How can we do it better? Because especially a lot of our agencies saying okay here do this Department of the Aged um, Community Center. And they know they get their one shot at it for a very, very long time. So they want, of course, to have everything. And what they get is a fraction of everything. So part of guarding principles has to do with how do we help our agency focus on what's the most important thing and help our agencies focus on what's the most important thing. Now, we are doing this through four lenses. Of course, this is on top of just the regular programmatic stuff that you have to do anyway. And these were sent to us by the mayor. The mayor also sent these lenses to every other agency in the city and saying, we need to, your agency to take a deep look at these areas and say, how can we more powerfully realize our work in terms of them? And so, of course, sustainability and resilience are very familiar to you. And uh, of course, that became the title of this talk. But in fact, the other two elements might, in a sense, be more deeply, uh, or shall we say, you as designers may be able to more deeply affect these other two. So I'll talk about they're very different items, and it's been really fascinating to work on them. So I'm going to start with the more familiar ones first. Under sustainability, DDC, I should also say that this, uh, I don't know if this term has appeared. Uh, no. Uh, yes, design and construction excellence. We have, we are working on our guiding principles under our uh, program, uh, a, really a core initiative for many years at DDC, design and construction excellence, where we're hiring the most talented architects and designers we, and engineers we can find. We're trying to get the best contractors in the city to work on our projects. And we're t we've taken a number of steps to try and get the, realize the highest quality design that we can. We know that you've probably been in a few city buildings or, or facilities that you thought no one tried very hard on these or this one's really worn out and we don't know what it might once have been. Uh, so, but Design Excellent has really changed that a lot. It's been going on for quite a few years. So now these deepen Design Excellent is what I really want to say. Uh, so sustainability, we're being called upon to really uh, very deeply cut the city's uh, reliance on fossil fuels. We're trying to, uh, we have this very high bar to meet in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Of course, that's not the only thing that sustainability is about. It's also about how we handle our sites. Can we get um, a deeper commitment to bringing ecology to our city? How are we handling water? A lot of these you, f you folks are very close to. So what we did under each of these lenses is we did five principles. And under those principles, we did five more aims. And so we have kind of 100 items. And, and so it takes, a, but it takes a lot of thought to sort of boil sustainability down to five principle. So, you know, but, and they can seem self-evident. It's like, yeah, okay, that's what you do. But in a sense, when our, our designers are called upon to do 
a lot of different things. You can say, oh, you know, the sustainability thing, you know, oh, we just, we can't fit it in. It just doesn't work. Resiliency, uh, I don't know. What was that about? Oh, something about Sandy? I don't know. It, you know, the day-to-day -day pressures are so strong that we actually have to remind people that these things are extraordinarily important. They're extraordinarily urgent to our city. So I won't go on about them, except that the bolded one on the bottom is what I'm going to go a little deeper into, just to say this is one of our current projects, Studio Gang out of Chicago, now New York. They have a New York office have done this rescue too. One of our typical projects, working for the fire department, and this is a replacement project. And so, you know, it's, it's a nice building, kind of fairly complex, sort of broken down, trying not to be hermetic, but in terms of sustainability, it has some rather powerful elements that maybe are not really obvious in the design. You can see the big whooshing arrow actually takes advantage of the idea that fire people leave the doors open to the equipment a lot of the time. Let's use that for vent natural ventilation. There are skylights that drive daylight very deeply down into this facility. Important because this is a 24-7 facility. These firemen spend a lot of time here. They sleep here. Uh, we've got green roofs. We've got kind of places where they can actually access greenery inside the building. Uh, because it's in Brownsville, a fairly dense part of the world. You see references to stormwater detention and geothermal energy. We're also collecting rainwater on the site and, we, and we're using uh, solar panels to heat hot water. So this is a very hard working little design. It's not a very big building, you can see. And that's fairly typical for us, but we're also aspiring higher. So one of the things where I'm trying to encourage our, our uh, project managers inside the agency, the agencies we work with, our designers, to look at these things that really take things far. This is the, uh, an unattractive picture of the Bullet Foundation building in Seattle. This is a net zero, net water, uh, net zero water, net zero waste building. We are a little bit far from that at DDC. But you learn a lot from looking at what they did. I mean, part of the reason it's a little funny looking is it's Seattle, so there's not a whole lot of solar energy to harvest. So the first thing to figure out is how big of a roof can we get? And so they had to do a lot of working with the city to let them have that big overhang, but it still supplies very little energy of the building. So all the rest, almost all the rest is being done through efficiency. So one of the things you see when you look, okay, it's not glamorous. You know, I can see really glamorous interiors in this, in this presentation. Uh, but you see, first of all, building made out of wood because it's supposed to last 250 years. You see no drop ceiling. You see not very much ductwork. That is the entirety of the ductwork. For those of you who've been on job sites, you know an office space like this would maybe have three times the ductwork volume. And look at the light fixtures, if you can even find them. There's a couple, a few little strip lights. This is a daylighted building. It's, it has to be the top floor. You look at those tall windows harvesting the rather gray light of Seattle. And these are all the kinds of things that are helping them get to uh, net zero. Another thing that I think will intrigue designers, so they have what they call an irresistible stare. They have to do everything at this building to get the energy use down. So they want people not to use the elevator. So that this stair actually has gorgeous views across the skyline of Seattle. It's full of daylight. It's made out of this beautiful recycled wood. And I won't go into all the other things that it does, but it, 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 these are the kind of things that we're starting to learn from. Now, this is a, it, I, I, I would, I hesitated to show you a building in construction. It's a little farther along, it's about a month old picture, but it'll be done soon. This is the Elmhurst Library, uh, one of our projects. Um, and what you see on the left is kind of a cube, a glass cube. And what makes this kind of sustainable in a lot of ways, or a way that I really admire, is this building uses daylight in a truly extraordinary way. I'm gonna talk about equity later, and, but I'm gonna remind, and I'm going to remind you to think about this cube again, because I'm standing on the street, probably where traffic is coming, to take this picture. And you see inside that cube, that's actually kind of a lounge space. It's, it's completely glass. So it's going to be an extraordinary, alluring space. And so people are going to hang out there. And passers are going to walk by and think like they do in the Apple Store. What's going on inside that building? What is, why are all those people there? 
Uh, and that is really an important aspect of what we call, in equity, of what we call inviting people to use our buildings and encouraging use of our buildings. So I'll talk later about why that's really important, but just keep it in mind. But for our purposes here, this is about daylighting, which I think is not only an energy con conserving tactic, I think just an extraordinary way to think about how interiors should work. So that big cube I sh showed in the previous images on the left, so you can see the light glowing. We're now basically in the center of the building. You can see the light glowing into the interior. On the right, you see that glass and you see out to an outdoor space. That will be a garden. This uh, library is actually wrapped in a garden. It's a very small library. It's a pretty small library and it's a pretty small site, but these architects went to the trouble to make as much of the view out and the view to nature as they could, and also to make as much of the daylight as they can inside. So this gives you a little flavor of what that cube space is going to be like when it's done. Uh, inside, again, this is the hallway that really connects all the main program spaces of the library. You see how the glow from that cube is now being borrowed by this hallway. You can also see more glass. Wherever you kind of look, the cube uh, is spreading light around and you see daylight and you see glass. So again, there are lights on in this building but you basically don't need them. So uh, there are of course lots of other aspects of sustainability I'm not going to dwell on, but I think for your purposes daylighting is just so important and, it's, and you'll see how important it is in other areas. So resiliency, some people say isn't resiliency the same thing as sustainability, but Really, we're talking about what we call extreme events. So it's the Hurricane Sandys, but it's also extreme heat. We really are going to expect um, greater heat waves, more sustained heat waves in New York City. We haven't had too many of them lately, but that doesn't mean they're not going to come because you certainly encounter them around the rest of the country. Uh, also, we, we use the euphemism human caused for terrorist attacks or, you know, crazy people deciding that they want to, you know, shoot up um, a government facility. Certainly that's happened. So we have uh, extreme events, you know, we're talking about, you know, urgent uh, disaster type events like storms, uh, storms and uh, extreme heat, human induced, uh, what we call coordinated disaster response because uh, especially in the city, we do all the facilities for first responders and we want to help them and help our agencies help them to, do, to help in, re, in disasters in the best way possible. Flexical ta flexible tactics, things change. Seas are rising, weather is changing. The tactic of today is not the tactic of tomorrow. Threats, human threats change. And then you're going to see a lot of reference in these uh, guiding principles to community capacity to adapt. We're talking a lot about communities in our guiding principles because we l have begun to learn that there's so many ways that design can really strengthen communities in a wide variety of ways, more than e I who have been very devoted to the idea of public architecture and the value of public design. Uh, really understood. So one of our big projects is the East Side Coastal Resiliency, straightforward, uh, but you know, turning an amenity into a flood resistant uh, landscape. So this is basically, you know, we're armoring the city against floods. That's one way of dealing with resiliency. Another way is how you handle buildings. So in the middle of this picture, which can maybe seem like it's about the Throgs Neck Bridge with the glowing building is the Zarega Avenue um, EMS, emergency um, uh, response, or emergency response people. And so what that is, is like what happens in a disaster. You still want those emergency response people to be able to get out. In fact, you want them more to get out. So suddenly sustainable elements come into their own. This is a largely daylighted building, so it doesn't need electricity to be able to be used. It has a solar thermal uh, elements on the roof, which among other things dry out the EMS people's hazmat suits, I didn't know this, which is a very important function for them to, to continue to be able to use. So I said, even if we're off the grid, we got to be able to dry our suits. There's also PV, but not a lot of photovoltaic, and it's to run their communication systems. They can get along with almost everything else not working, but the communications have to work. And then they did another thing. 
they said, well, okay, there's a lot of people unhappy about sirens and ambulances and all that thing and uh, all that sort of thing in their neighborhood. So there's a community garden next door, which you know is not really visible in the winter. But uh, so they collect the the roof underneath the snow is actually a green roof, and they collect the water and they share it with the community garden, and therefore have made friends. So that's how design can really help things happen in a community by doing things that make friends with neighbors that maybe are not so happy about. Uh, the presence of your facility. Same thing with sanitation garages. Nobody wants them in their neighborhood. Who wants a salt shed? So design really has a very strong role to play in engaging with these. So, you know, in resilience, we're thinking about flooding in a lot, wide variety of ways. This really lovely project that I wish was DDC, but in fact it was EDC with parks. Uh, that big oval, that's, a, that's to store floodwaters. It's a wonderful place for children to play, but in those times you need it at floor, it stores floodwaters. See the sort of stripey thing just below the center? That's another sort of infiltration landscape that we use. And then you see where the road curves up on the left, uh, that appears in this photo. These are uh, a form of bioswale that, again, we take the runoff from the bike lane, we take the runoff from the street, and we try and keep it out of the sewage system, which is a very big deal for reasons that are too long to explain, but basically we can't keep uh, dumping the street sewage into the waterways. We have to do with it better, and it turns out that these kind of green infrastructure interventions are usually cheaper than huge and expensive treatment plants. So we're doing a lot of this. But one of the other things we're doing is like, what happens in an emergency? How do you recover? What kind of facilities do we need for that? I was very taken by this project by Architecture for Humanity in Biloxi after Katrina. They said, nobody's organizing the recovery. People are wandering around the streets going, I need help. I don't know where to go. I don't know. Uh, no one's helping me out. So actually, a city councilman said, you know, we've got to coordinate all this. Architecture for Humanity jumped in and in the basement of a church that was only somewhat damaged by the storm. They set up this whole project and what you see on those blackboards, they took a case map, they drew maps of the neighborhood of every single property, turned each of them into a case and they managed their cases. So and so needs someone to help them gut out their house. So and so needs uh, an electrician to hook her uh, power back up. So all these volunteers that descended upon Biloxi from all over the country, extraordinary people, but they didn't know where to go or how to help. These people help them do that. So now, can we institutionalize that in New York? Uh, we had similar issues in New York of like, how do we organize those kind of recovery uh, efforts after Katrina? So this is the Far Rockaway Library done by Snohetta. This is not, I think it's on the verge of being in construction. Um, it's replacing a library that was severely damaged in uh, Hurricane Sandy, but had to be replaced anyway and was in a flood zone. This one is not. But still, it's got a very heavily, heavy programming of community rooms, all of which can be switched over into a kind of a recovery mode uh, to help people get the information they need, to help people get the help they need. And so we don't know how far that's going to go yet, but it's all possible in this facility. Because part of the guiding principles is people say, oh, is this something DDC does? Do we make recovery centers? Do we make places of refuge for people during disaster? It's not what we've done before, and it's not clear that it's going to be what we do do, but it opened this discussion with all of our agency clients and for, with the other agencies in the city that have to do with resiliency. So that's one of the very valuable aspects of these. Of these. So healthy living. Now, we became the place to go for healthy living because DDC was a very important par partner in helping to create active design guidelines that some of you may have heard of or even used. They, were, they came out um, a few years ago. And the whole idea is sort of incidental to anything else you're doing, we're going to help you live a more active lifestyle. We're going to make stairways really alluring. So in fact, I think I have an alluring stair. I'll show you an alluring stairway. We're going to make stairways really alluring so you won't take the elevator. We're going to try and have healthy food choices. We're going to 
place things that might encourage you to uh, you know, do some exercise, kind of in the path of your everyday world. So our guiding principles try and take these a few steps farther. A key one is right on top, supporting mental health and well-being. So you're saying buildings, mental health, isn't that really about programs? Isn't it really about therapeutic kinds of environments? Uh, research is showing that it's really important in a, in a lot of different ways. Uh, there was a sort of fascinating story, I think it was in the New York Times yesterday, tremendous amount of mental health research having to do with uh, what we euphemistically call vulnerable communities, which usually means poor, um, but also means aged communities where people are a little bit socially isolated or any community that's isolated often. Uh, mental health issues, but there's a very strong people who are poor and struggling and really trying to make things happen and it's not working suffer from very severe mental health issues. Now what can design do about that? Well, we can, there's a lot we can't do, but there's a surprising amount we can do and that's what's really fascinating. Some of the things are, are really obvious, uh, like plants, greenery, giving people access to greenery, but there's also some subtleties that maybe we're not so aware of. Uh, so one of them, I, I happen to love this uh, project, a university project uh, in Baltimore, but we, we talk about stairs that encourage use. This is really extraordinary because the stairs are practically the architecture. Uh, it's a 12-story building and it's a law school, so you think everyone's gonna go up and down on the elevators. Well, they'd never get to their classes if they had to do that. So they need people to use the stairs, having nothing to do with physical activity. So the architect, a rather brilliant architect named Banish, made that part of the work. They also drew daylight in in a wide variety of ways. You see that sparkly artwork thing. Actually, you even see into classrooms uh, from these public spaces, and they felt that that interactivity if any of you have done law work, you know that lawyers love, they love their compartments, they love their wood offices where the door can be closed and everything has to be very compartmentalized and we don't talk, because we need privacy. And yes, of course, you do need privacy. But I think what is happening in law is that, oh, we actually need to collaborate a lot. So this kind of openness is all part of, part of the picture, but it's also, part of the picture of active living and active design, that who would not want to use those stairs if you can? Obviously, they're elevators if you can't use stairs. But one of the things I totally love, the curvy one in the background is what they call the express stair. So if you're in an upper level, I forget, if you're on level eight, you can get all the way down to like level two or three without any intermediate stairs in the way. So you can really move fast if you need to. Uh, and I thought that was amazing that they, would, they you know, made that investment. Uh, another area, you know, so I mentioned briefly nature. Um, I really like this project, which is a very low energy project in Seattle, because it's this idea of bringing urban ecology inside. So they have plantings, and we've seen that. And they do it in a very nice way. The workspace is to the left in this image, and all the meeting rooms are to the right. So you tend in your day to day to move around and do your meetings and see who you need to see. You walk, first of all, under this beautiful daylighted skylight. You see the theme of daylight, uh, also dreary light in Seattle. Um, and, but also you see the plantings, and along with the plantings is a stormwater management system in which they actually collect the water from the site and bring it into the building. So even if you aren't looking out the window, you know when it's raining because all of a sudden there's a lot of burbling going on. But that actually has real mental health benefits. Uh, there's a lot of research that really shows that because it, it engages you with nature, it engages you with what, you know, the daylight also engages and is also very much supported in terms of mental health by data. The daylighting acquaints you with the progress of the day, tells you what season it is, sort of resets your clock a little bit. There's a lot going on because, of course, if any of you have experienced so-called value engineering, say, take out that skylight, costs too much money, what does it do anyway, it has to be maintained, please. Skylight's are very valuable. The daylight's very valuable. The planting's very valuable. Now, this is the one picture of the courthouse I've spent the week in. Um, how many different ways can you count that it says no smoking? And did you notice any of them when you first saw this image? Of course you didn't. Um, it says no smoking in many different ways. And I guess, you know, I suppose it works, but they have all sorts of people to enforce that uh, hanging around with, with uniforms on. 
But, you know, as we know, this is not design. This is not a thoughtful way to help people change their healthy habits. The alluring stare is how you help people change healthy habits. Putting really good food choices in front of people. So they tell me when they see, we aren't really going to be sequestered, but we're going to be in our room all day on Friday doing our jury selection, and they're going to hand us menus, and we're going to order from them. How much, how <clears throat> much on that menu do you think is going to be a healthy choice? I think not much. I think it's going to be a standard deli menu where everything is like a thousand calories and I'm going to get, say, give me some little, you know, dreary salad. Um, but our agenda in our new buildings, and maybe we'll get our hands on this one someday, uh, is that those choice, that healthy choices would be first on the menu, that, that there would be a nice cafe or a cafeteria. There's a grim little place you can buy food, but what's in it? Donuts. Um, and maybe lawyers subsist on donuts. They probably do. Uh, but that is really not the future, as we know. So just giving you a little sense of how meaningful and have to watch the time here, healthy living is. Um, this is another project that's uh, gotten a lot of coverage that maybe you're aware of called Via Verding. It's a, it's a housing project. It's a affordable housing project. This is a, this is a project with many agendas. There's peculiar pictures taken from the roof looking down. It's a little hard to figure out. But if you look at the bottom of the image, uh, there's sort of a grate. But then in partial shadow is actually a stairway. It's a stairway because this is a building where you can go into the courtyard and you can run up all of its many stair-step roofs and get up to about, I don't know, floor 11 or 12 or something. And there's a lot along the way. You go up the first set of stairs. Does this have a pointer? I meant to bring my pointer. No, okay. Is it the bottom one? Okay. You see, oh, there we go. So. Let me learn to aim. So, so you run up these stairs. These are Christmas trees, which they get to harvest. Another set of stairs, more trees that bloom in the spring, probably right now. Another set of stairs. Wait a minute, okay, to here. It's a little hard for me to read this picture. Uh, and here you, they actually have, these are vegetable gardens. And I realized in reviewing this, I forgot to put my picture of how beautiful the garden now looks. But I have another picture, because you can still go up farther, and let's just, see where we can go. This is actually pretty much the top of the building. Of course, it has a green roof, but also has these, you know, places where they grow their own vegetables uh, that I, that slide I forgot to put in for some reason. Um, these are actually my former students at City College, some of whom now work at DDC. First of all, you see the, the photovoltaics on the, uh, on the roof. That's a big part of it. But behind that glass is a fitness room. So you can actually run all the, most of the way up this building and go to a fitness room. Now, I don't know any of even the highly glamorous projects that are being done for super fitness-oriented people with money that does this much. And so we would love to do be this ambitious on our buildings. And hopefully you'll be this ambitious on, on your buildings, because this is these things are very uh, meaningful. Uh, this is another way to think about healthy living. This is a call center. So you call 911, not yet, but soon you call will be routed here to a very heavily fortified facility in the Bronx. But one of the things, and so what you, you imagine, what is a 9-11 call center job? It's a very stressful job. You're only getting a call if someone's un, under duress, under intense stress. They may be screaming. They may be incoherent. They may be saying, somebody is dying in front of me. And so that person standing or sitting at that desk has to be extremely calm. They have to say, Hold on, hold on, Mr. Please, sir, please, sir, slow down. Tell me what's really going on. Tell me where you are. I need to dispatch somebody as soon as possible. So they have to remain calm under these really difficult circumstances. So there's a number of elements about these buildings that are about stress reduction. And we have uh, a number of facilities that people have really stressful jobs. We have an emergency management agency in a big building in Brooklyn. We have many police and firehouses. These are very stressful jobs. And so we have to help police and fire because they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to talk about the stress. No stress. We don't talk about that. It's not what we speak about. Maybe some, if any of you, I know you, you're, some of you maybe in this room did some work on the 73rd Precinct in Brownsville, which I'm not well acquainted with, so I'm not going to talk about it. And also we're doing other things at the police that I can't talk to you about. Um, but someday I hope to because it's really fascinating. Um, 
So these desks go up and down. They have little white noise machines. They have little separate ventilation to help them so they can stand up, they can sit down, they can stretch while doing it, because it's really intense. And once they put you in this room, you are in here. You don't get to go anywhere. It's very high security. You don't get to leave the building until your shift is over. So it's not a fun job. But among the things they've done, they have windows, but the windows are very carefully angled so that's not easy to, I'm disclosing that you're probably not totally supposed to know, it's not, these windows are very thick. If somebody fires on it with something, these windows, it's really hard to actually let a, any kind of projectile get in here, and yet they can see out. And the architects have tried to point the windows to what greenery, there's some nice green around the site and then some not so pretty aspects of the site. They did the lighting with this peculiar scalloped seating. It almost looks like there's daylight in the room. It has a directionality. And that, but there's no, but the daylight, there is no skylight. It's really the lighting of the room that creates that feeling. And I tried, I had to doctor the photo a little bit to get it back to my camera. said, I don't know what color this is. And so I had to doctor it a little bit to get back to quite capture. But it's rather pleasant uh, light. So you think about, all those things in terms of reducing stress. This is another tactic. This is more something they're trying out. It's a little pilot project. Uh, these plants in this me mysterious medium that they're hanging in are actually for air filtration. And they want to really figure out how much plants really can contribute to healthier air. But it's also an amenity. It's kind of on the way to the cafeteria, which is a pleasant room, but the ch cafeteria choices are not the best, vending machines, um, so, so high security they didn't want actual, you know, people cooking things. Um, and so they want to really learn if this is going to be something that's powerful enough to really use in a wider way. But in the meantime, it's an amenity. It's just, it's just something nice to see as you walk back and forth. So, you know, these are the kind of things that we're really trying to do. And I'm going to go quickly, but I'm going to try and spend the most time on equity, partly because it feels like a buzzword or an abstraction, but we're really learning a lot. And I want to emphasize this, what I've sort of bolded at the top, access to essential services. I'm a little inept with this pointer. Access to essential services. In a lot of ways, what we talk about equity, you hear people say, well, wealth is inequitably distributed or goods are inequitably distributed or services. But what the way we look at it at DDC is like, we think it's about access. We think it's about access to what you need. And that's a locational thing that DDC does not have much control over because the agencies choose where to build and what facilities they have to work with. Uh, but we ask them to look at every aspect of what they do and say, how do we help people access services better? And that can be anything from a library, performing arts, a wonderful, we have some wonderful museum projects, but also be essential services. You, you know, you need your Medica Medicaid, you need your food stamps, things like this. All those things we work on. And so when we're looking at equity, we said, well, what, I, so ease access to resources is the second item. Uh, and that's really, really important because of this, the notion of especially the most vulnerable, vulnerable communities often don't have good access to the things they need. And we, there's a lot we can't fix, but we want to fix what we can fix. So, but we started with convey a sense of welcome to all. And I will credit our commissioner, who actually is behind the whole idea of guiding principles, uh, Fenioski Peñamora. He says, I want you to do these guiding principles, and I want you really to pay attention to equity, and I want you really to pay attention to the welcome, the invitation, the encouragement to use facilities because he's uh, from the Dominican Republic and although he's lived a long time here in New York and you know rose to become the commissioner and um, has had some other very prestigious projects, he remembers what his experience was like. And it's like, I didn't feel comfortable in certain these places. I didn't know if some, like for a lot of people, especially if you don't speak English well or don't speak English at all, is that library for me? Indeed, it is for you. Most of our libraries have uh, many, sort of in many, many languages. But part of it is like, do people know that? And, or can I, I have, uh, don't have legal Im immigration status. Can I go into a government facility and have somebody not call the INS? Yes, you can in New York. 
but we need to use the architecture to convey these messages. So this is a lot of what we're doing. And again, you see the strengthening communities as being a very important part of this. Uh, and uh, the reason that's bold is because I'm going to show you an example. So this is a, so okay, some of you may have worked on the 73rd precinct. This is another precinct in another part of the city. And part of what, if you went to the 73rd, you, you, you see a kind of ambiguous welcome to the public. It's a little, this one's a little fortress-like. It is not in Brooklyn, uh, like, like Brownsville 73rd is. Okay, on that blue stripe, you can sort of barely see it above the doorway. It says, you know, police station. Otherwise, you might not know. It also now says they, they put big decals on the doors saying, you know, NYPD. And of course, there's vehicles. If any of you even walked by a police station, you know, they're littered with vehicles, so you know. So like. Do I, is it okay for me to go in here and report a crime? Is it okay for me to go in here if I don't speak English? Is it okay, safe for me to go in here and report gang activity? The police really want you to do this. They really want people to engage with them. But they also, they're out in the streets all the time, and one of the things they think of their station as, and I'm putting a few words in their mouth, but as a refuge. This is the safe place. It's our place, our culture, where we can, let loose and we don't have to worry about what people are thinking about us and you know blow off steam it's a stressful stressful job uh, and so they tend to like this imagery of fortress and so it's a long discussion so this is what the lobby looks like and this is what the lobby of a lot of police precincts look like a lot of you would like to get your hands on this and say we could do a lot with this we could really transform this in a major way uh, but they're not sure about that. On some level, they, they totally want you there. On some level, they don't. Like, there's a lot of, we have interesting discussions. We've had some interesting discussions, one of which I will quickly recount because I'm going to run out. I should be stopping soon. Um, I won't recount it. But basically, there's a lot of ambiguity about the how we interact with citizens. And do we interact with citizens inside, in some other place? And citizens. Some of them never want to walk into a police station, never ever will walk into a police station willingly. Others is like, we want to be in there because we want to affect what you think of us. We want to affect how you deal with us. Uh, so one of the projects that we ha are working on is in the Bronx, the 40th precinct, and what you see on the left there is a community room. So this is a room that's not about any of the things that happen in that last slide. It is really a place where the community and the police can meet. It feels a little bit neutral, but it is also intended to invite engagement with the police. How powerful will this be? Well, you know, a lot of it has to do with the nature of how the precinct itself engages with the community. But most of these precincts, you know, they're learning their lesson. They know they have to do more. Some of them are trying all kind, are really brilliant at it. They're really trying all kinds of ways of engaging better with communities, and I think they're succeeding. And this is uh, an important step, I think, in saying we want to make the commitment in the very architecture, in the fabric of the buildings we live in, that we're connecting to the community. So I think that makes a powerful statement. You know, where when you talk about equity, we sort of say, okay. Um, what does this say about equity? What does it say about invitation? What does it say about encouraging people to use? Well, it doesn't say anything very nice about the city of New York. And we, and if, we would love to get our hands on this. Um, and we'd love to um, do, do a little bit better than this. Um, but of course, there's enormous pressure on resources. And we could eat, we have a six billion dollar uh, in of projects in process now. That's a lot of money. It is nowhere near what's needed uh, for what goes on in the city. So, okay, there's a library, probably built 25, 30 years ago. Does it say library? Barely. You can, there is somewhere you can find the word library. But it, do you know what goes on inside? Do you feel invited? Uh, is it even kind of intimidating and scary? Well, I'll let you be the judge. So this is, and this is in East Flatbush, not a glamour neighborhood of Brooklyn. And we said, we have to make that invitation really explicit. And I have to say, this is a design that came before guiding principles. In fact, a lot of these designs that I'm showing you do, which really shows the kind of insight of the architects and designers that we're working with, that they get it. 
um, without our having to tell them, but not everybody does. So part of it, as you can see what's going on inside, you can see what's going on on the street. They're mutually reinforcing each other. If I come by and say, I don't know if I should go in here, but then I see someone who looks like me, that maybe they also have language issues, or maybe they have immigration status issues, or maybe they're disabled and they're still there and they're using it. Okay, that's okay for me. And it says Flatbush, you know, every way. And I need to move along more quickly. Anyway, this is, a uh, rather handsome building, was it for homeless intake? And part of what this does is it treats people who are under very serious life duress with extraordinary dignity from, okay, the disability requirements say you have to have the dropped desk, but boy is it inviting if you're short, if you have children with you, children can see the person behind the desk, children can see what's going on, a lot of daylight, a uh, pleasant room, there's artwork right in the middle, and in in, anyway, you get the idea. Uh, this is uh, a work of Space Smith, the interior designer that I've just seen. I'm probably not supposed to be showing you this photo, so it's not quite open yet. Very, very critical facility, a uh, center that's basically about domestic violence. And in a way, it looks like a kind of ordinary, nicely executed work of interior design, but every single square inch has been thought about in terms of making the people who use this place feel safe, making them feel that they're going to be safe what goes on in the outside world, making it feel safe for the children that they may have with them. Uh, and also, but it's, it has to be an extraordinarily secure facility for obvious reasons. It happens to be right next to the district attorney's office and let's say it's a woman and let's say she's accused a man of abusing her. That man may be being brought into the DA's office right next door. Of course, the DA's office connects to this, which is really important for the function of it. There's not one square inch of this that's not really deeply thought about. I'm going to skip through this just to say how many, you know, this is a Civil War era building, was a once a town hall. Now it's used for, you know, to serve incredibly diverse neighborhoods and cultures, calligraphy. We've got a thing about the history of the neighborhood, African-American history of the neighborhood. Uh, this is a project, I would love to do one, something this nice. How do we treat disability? Do we treat it with dignity? Unfortunately, we don't have anything this nice in New York. This is in Germany. But this says, you're not only, we're not only meeting the regs, we're giving you a very dignified entrance and a respectful entrance into this building. So that's a lot of what goes on. And I'm standing here at the 9-11 Memorial. That chamfer was put into the project because the way that the whole rest of it was shaped, if you're in a wheelchair, you couldn't see into the pool. This chamfer works in such a way that if you're in a wheelchair, so that means you're about this high, you can see the water going into the pit, which is extremely important to this experience. And that was negotiated and figured out in a very, in a very long and thoughtful process. The role of art. I happen to just love this work of art. It happens to be in the Weeksville Heritage Center, which is about African American heritage. Is that African American art? Is that art for everybody? You decide, it does it really matter? I think it operates on many levels. Uh, and that's, I think, the measure of a really successful uh, work of art. Uh, this, um, this is not a DDC project. I, it's just a very interesting way to engage people. This is the startup box in the Bronx, where these are kids who are like, they're poor, but they're um, incredibly maniacal gamers. And what Majora Carter, sitting here on the right, is doing is turning them into coders and people who program computers because she makes arrangements. These people are all doing work for all kinds of companies that are not located in this particular tough neighborhood of the Bronx. So that's what it looks like on the outside. You think not much design there, but what design there is there is very important. So I can finally wrap up. Uh, these are a little bit how we say, what do you do with these things now that we have 100 of them? So this is just quickly what we, how we help people sort them out. You know, let's choose the ones that are consistent with project goals and really solve important projects that have a lot of benefits. And I'll stop there. If you're interested in our guiding principles, you can actually get the entire document on that web page. 
You can send emails about it because they come straight to me at that email. Um, and I'll try and answer any questions that you have about it if you're interested in them uh, or if you work for city agencies, for example. And we can take a little time for your questions. I'm sorry I went a little long. I know, it's always like, who's gonna ask the first question? Okay. Um, I thought, is the yeah, FDA, love. any, does it come into your purview at all? I'm thinking of the two bunkers on 2nd Avenue for the subway. Does the MPA, did you say MPA? Yes. Uh, no. You don't have any? Uh, we, the only thing we do with them, but it's actually with the Department of Transportation, is we make the bus stops for the select bus service. We can't hear you at the back, sorry. Oh, uh, back to the microphone. Uh, she asked, do we, do we do anything to MTA, you know, the people who run the subways? And no, we are not responsible for those gigantic ventilation buildings. Um, we are not responsible for the way the subways look um, or how they're designed. Uh, the way, way we engage with MTA is with Department of Transportation. We help them make the bus stops for the select bus service, and maybe more than that, we hope. So... MTA is a whole other world. Well, it's also run by Albany rather than New York. Yes, MTA is a state agency. Other questions, comments? No one wants to ask about my court case? <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the way in the back. Yell your question, please. I have one comment. Okay. Uh, on yes. It's still a construction site. Actually, well, libraries are really evolving. Uh, in that library, and all the libraries have books. And what really makes it complicated for librarians is they have to do books, videos, CDs, often in many languages. So they have limited space. It's really tough. They're trying to handle it. And they also have limited book buying budgets. So yes, there are books there. And I could have showed you pictures of libraries jam-packed with people, most of them reading actual books. Of course, a lot of people come and they take out the movies, but you know, especially children are enormously important to libraries. We're trying to have teen spaces in every library we can, which is not only for homework, but to say, okay, you may be on your technology all the time, you may not ever be able to get it out of your hand, but in fact, this library is an important thing and it's an important resource in your life. So you see a lot of that going on. Libraries do really a lot. They do even more, they'll tell you, if they had more money for programming. Most of our libraries are absolutely jam-packed. Yes? Do you work as teams when you have a project? Or how do you, uh, in satisfying all of these principles, right. it would seem like you'd need people from different points of view. Yeah, she's saying, how do we kind of collaborate on these? Well, we're trying to make these simple enough. They don't look simple, I know. Trying to make these simple enough that everyone can engage with them. And actually, we've been spent doing a lot of outreach uh, with our internal people. We have assortments of project managers and design reviewers. And we also have design liaisons who are actually assigned to help interpret these, as well as all the other design excellence elements with the architects, with the sponsoring, aid, uh, what they call the client agency. So that the discussion really happens in a productive way. You cannot cover all 100 items in any project. So you're looking for what are the ones that really matter? What are the ones that can actually make a difference? Uh, what are the ones that you, you know, what are the ones really connected to the kind of, you know, equity is very clearly for the Domestic Violence Center a big deal. Sustainability, yes, there are certain aspects of it, but it's not the key thing for, you know, a, a, it's a rather small facility, so. We have to, everyone has to sort that out together, yes. Do you do any evaluation after you complete a project to, to internally, you know, evaluate how many points you hit or to what degree? Oh, you've hit a sore point. <laughs> um, it is more of an aspiration than a reality. Part of what happens is um, it can be very, you know, we're under-resourced at DDC. So we all think, yes, we're going to do post-occupancy evaluations. We're going to sit down with everybody. We're going to look at the facility. We're going to get everything all optimized. In reality, it's been very hard to do. But it actually is an aspiration. And we're working to find a, a good way to do that um, to really very closely evaluate our facilities and how they work. Yes, right behind. Would you be able to work that out? 
Uh, no, it's not how it's done. They have commissioning agents. They actually go hire people to commission the buildings. I'm very happy to see you here. Uh, they hire people to commission the buildings. So they're the ones who have to make sure it operates properly after it gets started. And so programmatically, it's a little bit more up for grabs. And so it would probably not fall to the architects, although if they, I think the architects are interested in being involved, they probably can be, but it's more internally DDC working with um, internally the agency and internally the people who actually work at the facility to say, okay, how did it work for you? Um, and w what can we do better on the next one? So, yes. Yeah, we don't do the schools, that's why. Um, it's, this, it's the schools construction authority that does the schools. And actually, we share a building with them, but they are kind of hermetically sealed from us for reasons I don't fully understand, except the nature of you know, turf and bureaucracies. And so we live parallel lives, but in fact, our paths do not cross very much. Uh, you know, I don't know what their budgets are. Uh, New York schools are not inexpensive to build or renovate, however, so they're spending real money. It's not like they're starving and we're rich or the other way around. In fact, our projects have, our agencies dictate our projects, and some of them have, police and fire have a lot of money. Uh, libraries really have to struggle to get their money. It's, a, it's, there's, Oh, it's so complicated, the funding sources, and I'm not going there because I don't even understand it myself. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that, um, you know, there's a parallel, but I don't know. I don't think there's a huge difference. Um, you already asked questions. I'll make sure there's uh, others. Oh, OK. Um, yeah, I, was, I mean, it seems like you have a sort of an impossible job. Um, That's what everybody up there thinks. <laughs> material and how much you know is it you're advising and also does that mean you're looking for grants that you basically use your perceived money and, and then you get a grant from the feds or from the state no six billion extra is the construction value and a huge percentage of that is actually streets that you know the fact that every street in the city seems to be ripped up that's a lot of our money uh, working with DOT uh, which is Department of Transportation, working with uh, Department of Environmental Pro Protection because they do all the drainage systems in the city. And so that is, buildings are actually a relatively, believe it or not, small percentage of that money. Yeah, yeah. So, but you know, they're hugely important, DOT and D DEP. So we try to be nice to them. Yes, go ahead. Can you design the streets? Like I saw something on the Second Avenue subway yeah, well, what happens is the consultants design it. And so they're consultants to both us and the Department of Transportation. We kind of manage the process for DOT is what we really do. So we work with the designers, but uh, you know, it's very much DOT standards. They have a street design manual. We have to follow it. The designers have to follow it. And so that's an assortment of um, architects, engineers, um, and landscape architects. That the green infrastructure obviously involves landscape architects. So. Yes? Um, I just had a question about uh, the International Passive House Standard. And we, uh -huh. uh, Mayor Palazzo specifically called that out as a potential pathway to the, the 80% uh, carbon reduction yes. by 2050. And there's been mm -hmm. some recent laws passed here in New York City. Um, what, uh, it, it, it seems to address a lot of these, these issues like sustainability, resiliency, comfort, and health, all those things. What are, first of all, your opinions on the International Passive House Standard? And two, um, what is the DDC doing about uh, implementing a plan to educate people in Google? Well, this really impacts us very directly. And there are certain things in the laws and then a lot of things that have to be sorted out. And so we're in the process of sorting that out right now. These are very demanding. Um, standards being set by this legislation. And uh, it's a really taking a very leader, leadership position. So we have to sort out, because we could say, sure, whatever you want, we'll do. But our client agencies are going, uh, someone has to come up with the money. It, to the extent it costs extra money. So they say, someone has to come up with the money. So there's a lot of uh, negotiation going on. Passive House, 
The trouble is I'm slightly under expert in passive house. I always thought passive house is something for a mild climate with relatively low occupancy loads and others relatively few people using it. I'm not sure I fully understand how passive house works in a humid climate with a lot of cooling loads. Uh, and I think, and so what they've set up is actually passive house is one pathway. You can also just go for straight, get, you know, hit these targets. They actually have three pathways. The other is, uh, I think, one defined by LEED 4.0. Again, a very demanding version of LEED that's new. And so I think what they're going to do is run a number of projects, and this is not set in stone, by the way, but I think it's not shocking that we would do this, uh, a number of projects to let people find out with elaborate energy modeling what seems to be the most successful way to go. And so then some of these paths may actually be eliminated. I think the legislation sort of says, eh, if it doesn't really work, you know, uh, it can be changed. Or you can choose path two. So we're, there's going to be a lot of trying out stuff over the next few years. And if any of you are working for firms that do work for the city, you're going to be involved in helping us sort that out. So. We actually have 26 new firms in our design excellence program that are about to be announced. They know who they are. They who knew, know who they're not. I don't know either of these answers. They're not telling me because it's a big secret until, you know, this is the city bureaucracy. They sign on the dotted line with every single firm on the contract that they want to do, and they're not speedy about that. So actually, maybe in the next couple of weeks where we may be announcing, but it may still get delayed a little longer. I thought it was already going to happen. I know who they are, but I don't. But they know who they are. Um, any other questions? Probably should wrap up pretty soon. Uh, so, uh, adaptive reuse of buildings and sites, right? Yes, absolutely. We, we have a landmark group that works with landmarks. Our projects are frequently presented to the Landmarks Preservation Commission. So we're very sensitive to landmark issues and to adaptive reuse. Um, in fact, one of our guiding principles, which really is more under the sustainability um, category, is like try to find the way to use any existing building fabric because of the embodied energy in it, but also that inevitably includes, you know, buildings of historic value. I might say a number of our projects also go to the Public Design Commission. Some of you may be familiar with that. That's basically the design review board for city projects. Not everything falls under that rubric, but things that have pretty noticeable neighborhood <laughs> impact tend to be reviewed by the uh, Public Design Commission. So we work very closely to make, with the architects and the sponsoring agencies to make sure that PDC is going to be happy with what is submitted. So, and they're great for us. They're kind of an architectural watchdog. So they help support our effort. I'm in what's called the Office of the Chief Architect, which I should have mentioned early on. And we're part of the enforcers of good design too. So that, you know, we work at, we're closely with LPC and Landmarks to try and get the best design we can get. Um, in the city. Uh, maybe that's the last question. Regarding all those projects, all mm -hmm. the buildings and all the yeah. buildings, have you performed or did you see have performed any uh, post occupancy evaluations to test, to verify that everything, maybe, um, we said, uh, you satisfy the requirement that were initially in the design? Yeah. There's an initial process because we have, especially for design excellence project, something we call the design metric, which is really setting out a lot of, and they're mostly design type issues. They're not like, did it hit an energy utilization index of X? It's really about, did the criteria that we set for kind of good design at the beginning, they are evaluated at the end, but they're really evaluated at the end of construction. It may even be before occupancy. Post-occupancy is what we've had trouble with to try and go back and really do that. Um, the commissioning agencies are supposed to make sure the mechanical, electrical, all the systems perform properly when it's taken you know, over by the agency that's going to use it. Um, it's more the after after that we would like to be better at. So, okay, I think we're, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, don't hesitate to uh, check us out.